Right. So just before I hand over to my colleague, Chris Williams, um, who will chair our first session, I want to briefly introduce um, our, our webinar series. So over five years ago, the New Economics Foundation put out a paper outlining a common vision for coastal communities. That is, it is possible to create and support good jobs and livelihoods and to have and maintain a healthy coastal marine environment. We call it the Blue New Deal project, similar to the more famous Green New Deal, but focused on the particular challenges for both people and nature on the coast. The Blue New Deal is a plan for huge investment in the economic future of coastal communities to combat the crisis of inequality, climate and ecological breakdown all at the same time. Now we know that the UK is an island nation and the Blue New Deal is also an opportunity to bring the ocean into our climate and economic recovery discussions. Our UK waters extend to more than three and a half mile, uh, three and a half times our land area. And yet we seem to pay very little attention to this vast treasure and um, incredible resource that we have. Our approach to driving the Blue New Deal project has been to first acknowledge that every day on our coast, people are already fighting and working for that vision, but they needed to become more connected. So our goal was to bring together what are still um, unfortunately fragmented efforts along our coast to build the power of and to scale up good practice, to make it the norm rather than the exception. So at the end of 2016, as I mentioned, NAF launched Turning Back to the Sea, um, which is an action plan co-developed with hundreds of people from all regions of the UK coast to deliver that Blue New Deal vision. This plan outlines the approach and the actions, policy and investment needed at local, regional and national level to help transform the way our coastal economies work. Now, a lot has happened in the past five years. Um, we've had the damaging impacts of austerity that are now better understood and have greatly impacted our coastal areas who are heavily reliant on um, public services and um, public sector jobs. The Brexit vote happened and we are still living the ongoing risks and uncertainties of a UK outside of the EU with new policy and new trade deals still unclear. We have a stronger and more organized climate movement. And after the election last year, a large conservative party majority in power. This year we got COVID-19. So we are today living with multiple complex and intrinsically linked crises and challenges. Many of these structural issues that we had been living with for so long already have been enhanced and also been made impossible to ignore because of COVID. These pandemic times are taking the wrongs and the dirt of our current social, economic, and political systems from under the carpet. And as they become exposed, it has to be inevitable, I think, that the time is now to make the deep changes we need to make in our society and our economy to make us all happier, to improve the way we live, to make our communities more resilient to all these challenges, and to really invest and cherish our relationship with nature. So to me, the Blue New Deal for the UK coast has never been more pertinent. We've done the work, we know what needs to happen, we know how to transform things. Now that there is a public debate and the necessity for government to support a green and fair recovery, what does that mean for our coastal areas? It means green and blue jobs, and it means ensuring that the benefits of a recovery are felt everywhere, in particular, by prioritizing places that have been held back um, for the past decades, like our coastal areas. So that's just a quick introduction and the big picture context for our webinars. For today's session, we start by asking, what has been happening in coastal communities in the past five years? How have these challenges been felt locally? What's the work they've been doing towards building that vision? And what's the learning and successes achieved so far? So now I'm going to hand it over to Chris, my colleague, um, to host, chair, um, and guide the first session. Thanks very much, Fernanda. And thanks for that really positive um, and uplifting framing about the times we live in. And I'm just in case we run out of time towards the end, I just wanted to thank you for the enormous amount of effort and time you've put into this project um, over the last 
sort of six or more years um, and without you none of this would have happened so I really think you should be very proud before you go off on maternity leave for what you've um, achieved and the huge number of people you've managed to involve in this project which I think has been really quite unique. Um, so as Fernanda mentioned um, the Blue New Deal was launched originally as a report which looked at the particular sort of challenges facing coastal economies that was then followed with an action plan which was developed with hundreds and hundreds of people of and organizations to look at these challenges and how to overcome them in coastal areas. Uh, the main focus of that action plan was five key sectors of the coastal economy, the small scale coastal fishing sector, aquaculture, tourism, renewable energy, and also coastal management. Following the launch of that action plan, we then focused on work in particular places to make those changes, which we co-developed with lots of other people, actually happen. So Fernando has been running the Blue New Deal at a sort of national level and engaging with all the coastal partnership net networks. And I've been working on some of the sort of place-based um, projects that we've been involved with over the last six years. We've been working in Pool, where we helped the small scale fishing fleet get access to structural funds to improve their safety in uh, the shape of the pontoons and they're basically um, the fishing key that they operated from. We did some work on looking at water quality and its impact on shellfish production because pool is the biggest oyster and one of the biggest mussel uh, aquaculture areas in all of England. And we really worked there to make the coastal sectors visible, valued and understood in local decision making um, using our community economic development process. We also worked in Weymouth doing very much the same thing there, focused on small scale coastal fishing and charter boat fishing making sure that their value to the local economy was understood and promoted as changes there in the harbour were taking place. We worked in Plymouth um, with Caroline Bennett, who's going to be speaking later as well, helping develop a low impact fishing standard so that we can drive the environmental impact of fishing down, but not try to compete with some of the big sort of sustainability labels, but rather give consumers that sort of assurance that they can support their local fleet and a healthy marine environment. And then we've been working as well in Eastbourne for the past six years, helping the small scale coastal fishermen access structural funds and develop community economic development plans um, and also a fishing key, which we'll hear about. So today we're very fortunate to be joined by three crucial people in all of these places and projects. Uh, the first is Caroline Bennett, who's a social entrepreneur and the founder of Soul of Discretion, which she will talk about. We also have Graham Doswell, uh, calling from the wheelhouse somewhere off Bex Hill, I'd imagine at the moment, who's a third generation small scale fisherman and the director of the Eastbourne Under 10's uh, community interest company. We also have Adam Bryan, who's the chief executive officer of the Southeast Local Enterprise Partnership, who've been an absolutely crucial organization in our work in Eastbourne. So we're going to hear from them very shortly, find out about some of the key lessons and the main impact of the work that we've been doing there. And then we're going to follow that up with some, some questions and discussion from me and then some questions from the audience. So I think in the first instance, we may as well hear directly um, from the people that we, we've been working with. So I would like to invite Caroline, please, um, to speak for five minutes. Let us know who you are. Let us know where you work and what you do and tell us about the, the problem you faced and how you've sought to overcome that problem in the work that you're doing, please. Thank you, Chris. Um, good to be here. Um, here being uh, Liverpool Street Station. Um, there you go. Could, just trying to compete with Graham out there on the, on the boat. Um, so I, I suppose now is, I mean, it was interesting the second point to Fernanda's thing that everybody senses this, um, pivotal point where we potentially might be able to change the course of the direction of, of where the planet is clearly ha heading. Um, and with what's going on over the other side of the ocean, it makes me very concerned having met so many Americans who are so, um, so illuminated by the problems that they face in their own fisheries over there and so united by their cause to come together and to try and solve it. Um, I first came to be interested in the fisheries, one through running a restaurant, but um, in this sense through the organization called Slow Food. Um, they're an Italian organization, very loosely organized, but essentially their role for me has been bringing together like-minded people to understand that their voices 
aren't alone that they that collectively they can they can come together find strength in that and potentially make differences and of course the potential is just is just there we just have to make it happen um and i suppose that's why i ended up becoming a fishmonger um i i have seen what msc has done they've done some fantastic things they've brought to um, the attention of the general public that there is huge problems out there. But for me, they were missing the vast swathes of fishermen that I'd met through the Slow Food Organization, who, wherever they are in the world, are left with the same problems, whether it be access to the fishing grounds themselves, whether it be um, access to simple things like ice plants or a place to process and land their fish, and of course then access to markets. So whether they were in rural places in South Africa or um, ex extraordinarily well-financed ground, fishing grounds in Europe and North America, the, the problems were actually very common. Um, so I set up to work um, in Soul of Discretion. It's a community interest company owned by the fishing community that land to it. It works exclusively with the under 10 meter boats. Um, we provide them an ability to land the fish and process the fish. I have to say Plymouth is the place probably in, in the whole of Britain that least needs soul of discretion because they have on my doorstep such a fabulous auction. Um, which is really run um, very, very competently for the benefit of the fishing community rather than for the wholesalers. Um, so it wasn't the most natural or obvious place to be, but nonetheless, we are there. Um, we pledge to take all the fish that the fishermen land, so they might be any species or any size, and that's quite critical in the sense that a lot of the demand for some of the species is driven by larger scale uh, supermarkets who will say they want a certain number of species, so a very limited number of species, and they all need to be this size because that's the size that fits neatly on their processing equipment. So we will take anything from very small fish to very big fish, obviously if they're legal, um, and we will pledge to do the right thing by those fish um, you know they've they've they died for us we process them we fillet them we put them into packaging that goes to the end um, customer in a usually a 300 gram fillet um, that has the name of the boat and the method of catch on every single pack um, so we are providing full traceability back to the to the boat for the consumer um, We've run into difficulties with the NGO community because we quite proudly say, well, yes, if a fisherman has caught it, we will use it. So for example, uh, uh, rays um, or conga eel, these are, these are species that are deemed to be very vulnerable, not encouraging our fishermen to catch them, but if they do catch them, we will make best use of them. Um, and the same with the very small species, the very small, sorry, fish. Um, people will say, well, they're very, they're immature. They shouldn't have been caught. We don't want to be supporting that. But the sad fact is that the majority of fish, not, not even some of the fish, the majority of fish are these very small, immature fish that I agree shouldn't have been caught in the first place, but they have been. And that rather than put them in fish meal or pet food, we pledge to make them into tasty um, nutritional food for human consumption, which of course requires skill and effort, which most large scale processing plants simply can't afford to do. Uh, we have highly skilled labor, hand filleted labor from processors that have been doing it for an awful long time. And they can like, say, yep, I can do that scale of fish and I can do that fish, it doesn't matter. I'm not a robot, I can tackle that. And that's another real crucial thing, I think, to honoring all these species that have, have been fished for us um, in, our, in our food web. Um, yeah, the traceability, I think, is the thing that really highlights us from as far as I'm aware, any other thing in the retail market, I don't think yet there is another standard that insists on full traceability back to the boat. And as I say, Chris has already sorry, as Chris has already said, we're creating, we're looking to create this um, 
standard and I say that very loosely because from my experience with slow food uh, standards and um, certification are often merely means of somebody tick, tick box exercising something to say that they've created um, a means of providing fish to accommodate probably everybody that's listening to this webinar, those of us, the small number of people in the planet that do want to make an active choice in their food um, purchases to make a difference. It's a tick box exercise and we need to be very careful that that's whatever standard we do create doesn't simply um, accommodate that tick box, box exercise, but does create genuine change. And I think that's the, the crisis that we all face and that we're all here to try and resolve. Thank you so much, Caroline. I do have some supplementary questions, but I'll, I'll ask them after the other speakers, if that's OK. Thank you very much. Um, we move on now to Graham Doswell. Can you hear us, Graham? He's out at sea today. I will just, can you unmute him, please, Fernanda? So, Graham, I was hoping that you could talk to us a bit about who you are, where you're from, and the problem you faced and how you sought to overcome it down in Eastbourne, please. Okay, yeah, I mean, the, the Eastbourne fleet, uh, probably say 30 years ago, was all uh, just a beach launched fleet. So the fleet was sort of scattered along little bays um, around the, the Sheetal beaches around the Sussex coast. And when we heard that there was a chance that um, Tarmac were going to develop a harbour at Eastbourne, we You know, obviously, very, very interested to try and sit around for quite a few years. We had quite a few meetings with them, and, and a lot of promises uh, that were made to the fishing fleets to try and get us to support the, the harbour bill, which needed to get through for this big development. And um, finally, the harbour, the harbour bill got through, and we, um, one or two of the boats, came into the harbour and sort of started working out there. but. There didn't seem to be much happening as far as the promises that were made for the um, infrastructure for us that they promised. So we carried on. A lot of people were just really quite just pleased to be working out of the harbour, whatever the conditions were. And uh, this was sort of went on for about, I, I guess, around about 20 odd years. Uh, and then suddenly we were actually getting the Housing was sprouting up all around us, we were back uh, to, to another, and uh, we just realised then that actually, you know, we better start trying to make this a reality and try and do something here, otherwise, we just to be shoved out. Uh, and it displaced all our other harbours right near. It all came to a head. We had a, we had a letter, from, actually, had a letter from uh, the, the Sovereign Harbour at the time to say. Can you please move all your fishing gear off the quay? Um, this land is going to be developed. So, uh, and a big sort of fish. It's amazing, which is quite unusual. And um, we'll see if we could possibly purchase the land. We went through one of the things like coast community funding and other stuff like that to try and. Try and get some help, try and get some time. funding, um, you know, to be able to struggle. And um, it wasn't really until um, somebody put me in touch with Chris, who I'd actually know anyway, but didn't realise he, he would uh, maybe be able to help us. And um, spoke to Chris about it. and. Uh, and, uh, and over the years, we've gone from being on a sort of a building site with absolutely no facilities. And uh, so what I've just left this morning on the quayside there, uh, um, a fantastic building uh, and um, something in which will give the Eastbourne fleet a, a real chance, a really good future. 
where we can market our own fish, um, retail our own fish to the general public, and just generally, uh, hopefully, create some sort of better markets and some better prices. So it's really, really exciting, and uh, our office this path, and it's something that we absolutely would never have been able to do without the help of NEF. It's um, it was just fantastic to you know to, to get involved with NEF, and they were able to help us. It's just luckily at the right time. Um, there's uh, it was just so difficult to, to access. We tried putting in. Um, we try to put in for funding and, and really just weren't actually getting anywhere but it's so complicated even the administrators of the fund didn't really understand how it works and we certainly didn't so it's taken a real um, a bit of an untangling for um, uh, some of their best never have done that course to, to give us the opportunity you know, that we've got now. Thanks. Thanks so yeah. much, Graham. It's the reception is actually really poor and it keeps cutting out. So I've um, put a link in the chat to the video we made where Graham tells the story of the key. That was made in 2017. Since then, obviously, there have been um, some major developments, uh, one of which is um, the involvement of the Southeast Local Enterprise partnership so I think maybe if we if we move on to Adam's section that might be easier because quite a lot of that was cutting out obviously on a day like this when it's not windy after weeks and weeks of bad weather um, Graham had to be at sea today so apologies for the reception but that is the nature of being an inshore fisherman you have to watch the weather you can't stay at home and forego a day's income to join this webinar um, so for now, if we could just quickly move on to our next speaker, who is Adam Bryan from CELEP. Um, Adam, welcome. And could you please tell us a bit about what CELEP does and why CELEP have supported this project in Eastbourne and what you think is special about it? Thank you. Uh of course, thank you, Chris. And it's been really fascinating so far. So I hope I can keep the, the interest level up because I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious that a lot of the stuff that we often talk about tra doesn't translate in quite as exciting a way. So I'll try and keep the, uh, try and keep the tempo at the same level. Um, so the Southeast Electoral Enterprise Partnership, um, we are a, an organization effectively, which brings local authorities in the public sector together with business locally um, to really make a case for um, investment in um, our part of the world and our part of the world for the Southeast LEP happens to be East Sussex as well as Kent and Essex. Um, LEPs nationally are, um, I guess, the key conduits for um, investment in economic growth projects. So government over the course of the last five or six years have used LEPs as, as those conduits. So major funding to go into local projects generally comes through us. Um, and we have a system in place to make sure as is evidenced with this particular project, that actually, you know, those decisions around what's supported and what rise to the, rises to the top in terms of priority absolutely comes from the local area. Um, although we are a large LEP in terms of the area that we cover, the way that we organise ourselves is absolutely, you know, from the bottom up. So, um, and I think, you know, no better example that, than this project, really. So, um, I'm, I'm really, so I'm Adam Bryan. I'm, I'm really pleased to do this, to undertake this role. I've been doing this role now for five or six years. Um, and we've been able to really turn around, turn the organization around um, and having that local focus, that genuine local focus is a really good, um, a really good turnaround that I think we've been able to enact. The, just to give you our perspective on this project, to give you some of the numbers around it, which I think helps because I'm, I'm sure I'm sure that Graham would have would have said some of this. Um, so I'll, I'll fill some of the gaps as far as I understand them. So the Fisherman's Key, an infrastructure development project in Eastbourne, um, is a project that we've put um, about 2.2 million pounds in to get off to help get off the ground. Really delighted to do so. Effectively, um, the site has been for a long time um, an open air, open air area for landing and preparation of fish and shellfish. 
And what we're talking about moving to rather three phases of work is creating a, a vibrant multi-purpose destination which combines facilities for the fishing industry, but also a, a visitor destination um, to, to, in, to improve um, sort of visitor footfall in, in the Eastbourne area as well. Three phases of the work well underway. So phase one is, is around um, sort of a space to house equipment for um, cold storage and processing. Um, and also that uh, there's, there'll be space there for um, wet fish sales as well. Phase two will be f further build out of the facility, which will include further storage space, uh, f further storage space, as well as a repair workshop for the fleet as well. And phase three, then we move into the visitor centre element of the project, um, and that'll include uh, a training venue as well, um, courses around sea survival and first aid, et cetera, et cetera. So really are talking about a multi-purpose venue that, that should have a major impact on, on Eastbourne. It's really exciting. And, you know, for me, it's it's a bit of a no-brainer when you think, so just, just thinking about the question that you just posed, Chris, um, I think you know, in answering the question, why did Celeb support this project? I suppose when organisations like mine became established the best part of eight or nine years ago, um, from the very early days, a lot of the funding that we were given um, came effectively from the Department for Transport. So there's a real focus on, you know, um, road improvements and, and heavy infrastructure in interventions. To get to a place where we're able to, su su to support projects like this is, you know, it is absolutely where we need to be. We need to be local. We need to be locally um interested and locally driven a project like this is about you know economic resilience it's about local supply chains it's about not relying on lengthy supply chains over a much broader area it's about supporting local markets um it's really about ensuring as, as graham said towards the end um a sort of longer term the longer term resilience of that sector in that location um, and and really, when you look at it, we're, we've got you know we've got a really lengthy process for the development of business cases and the agree because you know governance and transparency for us is really important. We need to demonstrate that we're spending money on the best projects, on the projects that are going to have real local impact that demonstrate value for money. This project ticks all those boxes. So we were absolutely you know under absolutely no doubt that this this was a direction to go for us. And I think it's really more important. Yeah. You know, I guess it's even more important because we've got a real focus in our LEP on supporting the coastal economy. Um, our overall strategy for the organization has got a big focus or, or actually when the new version of it's finished, we'll have a, a major focus on, on supporting the coastal areas of the LEP because we've got the low, longest coastline of any LEP when you consider what the, the coastline across Essex, um, Kent and East Sussex looks like when you, when you follow it round. So it's really, it's not enough, I think, to, to just say, oh, we've got a really long coastline without putting our money where our mouth is and having a real strategic focus on supporting the opportunities and the issues that, that abound in coastal areas. Um, we've also got, and just, just looking at some of the people involved in the call today, I, I certainly is one very familiar face and um, good morning, Tom, um, involved in this conversation um, that was very much involved in, in developing our coastal prospectus, which is all about boosting coastal productivity. So for us, in as much as we can, we focus our strategy in that direction. I suppose what we do with the funding that comes through us is, is absolutely you know, born of the local area. It's inspired by the local area and by inspirational people like Graham, I would suggest. Um, as we move forward, um, you know, we've got a really strong coastal group. We've got a, a coastal working group where, where people of the sector and the local areas come together to really inform us as to, you know, what the key issues are. Um, we operate like that. I know some of our colleague laps across the rest of the country do have similar, although I would always say less good, um, ways of engaging the coastal areas. Um, but the key for us really is to keep the pressure on on government and and you know help them realise that that supporting um, coastal areas is every bit as important as any other part of the economic na narrative that they have at the moment. So we know, for example, that there's an awful lot of um, focus on the levelling up agenda at a national level where you know traditionally that's about you know there are economic challenges in the north and the midlands and everybody across the south of england is generally better off we know that's not the case we know there are issues of of coastal deprivation across our patch but we also know um that there are great examples of of sectors in the coastal areas that, that could really thrive with the right interventions 
we need to continue to make that case. We need to continue to demonstrate that projects like this will have a, a major impact on um, on the local, not just the local economy, but but the regional economy. Um, and we'll play our part in doing that. And hopefully, when um, the future plans from government for economic growth are, are made clearer um, in in terms of how they channel funding through to it, we'll have a role to play, and we'll be able to make sure that we're us and our colleagues across the rest of the country, of course, will be able to ensure that that funding is is absolutely focused on on the coastal areas. And that's that's all. Looking at the time, Chris, that's all I think I've, I've got the opportunity to say at the moment. Adam, thanks ever so much. And thanks very, very much indeed for your time, but also for filling in the gaps for what Graham would inevitably have been talking about if we could have if we could have heard some of it more clearly. Um, I think what's really um, interesting is the different ways that the LEP has actually supported this project because getting the structural funds from the EU and writing that grant application was one thing, but you only get those funds once you've already completed the project and sent through the invoices. So this bankroll, bankrolling sort of bridging loan from the LEP, this 0% this interest loan, has really been necessary to make the structural funding work. And that's really important for small scale producers and lots of independent businesses that come together for this kind of project. So this loan facility that then gets paid back and can be lent out to other projects is a really fantastic idea and it's been essential in this project, but also the ability for the LEP to give grants and the grant um, to cover 80% of the costs of phases two and three is so important. And I think the LEP, um, other than sort of the belief in the fishing fleet and the potential and the need to sort of secure their future, this link to the tourism and heritage economy is obviously a uh, a big opportunity in itself. I know that in Hastings they've run seafood festivals and they have a, you know, the contribution of fishing to the tourist economy is far more than the landed value of fish that they land. So I think really plugging into that sort of, uh, you know, local economy, tourist economy thing, especially in, in sort of, you know, future lockdowns and, and, and sort of stay at home holidays is going to be really, really important in building resilience. I wanted to ask um, Caroline just quickly, because it was something that Adam mentioned. How do you think the kind of work that you're doing at Soul of Discretion and that you're helping us with in Eastbourne is important in making a more sustainable and more resilient seafood system. And if you could talk about your experience, please, Caroline, about, about sort of the impact of COVID. And I think that would be really interesting for people. How have people's buying habits changed? How has the demand changed? What has happened to your community interest company as a result? Please. I think the resilience comes in um, to be flexible with what see so nature doesn't just deliver cod and haddock and to it, it us of that different species so part of it is taking these under utilized under valued species and looking after them in the same way as every other species is and being able to produce tasty protein um, for the end consumer. So things like pouting or ling or even dog feet, processing of that or the, the catch, the catch method of that. I'm shifting people's focus away from the big, the big five. Um, areas in the community, I mean, it's just beginning to happen again now, literally as of Sunday, we started another up, up um, take people wanting to um, increase their orders directly through um, or organic online distribution mechanisms. Um, so this, we saw a four-fold increase in the first lockdown. Uh, we're seeing a doubling so far. The fishermen were saying, well, we're not gonna go out to sea because the price is collapsed in the previous one. And we're, I've preempted that by sending out an email saying, guys, we're still buying, the prices are unchanged. This is the fair price. This is not driven by market economics of the auction. So delivering a fair price that a fisherman can still cover the costs of his fuel, still make a, a decent living when he's come back um, from hauling, um, that's very much part of a, of a community interest company for the fishing people, uh, uh, community. Um, so I, I think that, that that resilience, and then that this is sort of mis misnomer that boat simply supply enough fish to satiate the demand that's there. And on all the 
all the um, scientific research that's done, or at least the ones that I look at. So Daniel Pauly is a fabulous uh, marine biologist and his research clearly that not just in Yerkaluli, small scale fishes can in fact step up to the plate and do in fact land sufficient volumes of fish to satiate demand um, from for human consumption. So sort of pushing that not just relying on the small scale. It's not. It's doable. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Caroline. And your experience has been hugely valuable in this project and your involvement in it is going to be ex essential in its success, mainly because the shift that has to take place in Eastbourne, uh, to a large extent, is about where the fish and shellfish ends up. So um, a question from the audience was about the, the, the scale of kind of um, export reliance at present. And I mean, the majority of landings in Eastbourne at present are whelks, which are exported to the uh, through an EU free trade agreement with South Korea to the South Korean market where whelks are, you know, a, a sort of luxury and, um, you know, specialty sort of delicacy. Um, but the shift obviously needs to happen in terms of moving um, that focus away from export markets, especially with Brexit coming and the impact of tariffs and things like that to the EU, which also obviously is where a lot of the seafood ends up and trying to re-educate and reacquaint um, local people with their sort of seafood past and with the huge diversity and variety of sustainable options. Caroline spoke about the big five, which is haddock, cod, salmon, tuna and prawns none of which are really caught in Eastbourne, but there's lots of stuff which is equally as good, more sustainable, and you can support your local fleet and a sort of a low impact, low fossil fuel, um, local way of consuming seafood. So it's part of that transition. I know that Graham wanted to thank all the other people that have been involved in the project, but I think we've actually lost him now from the call. So he must be another another mile offshore. So apologies for that. But um, this project wouldn't have been possible without support from Eastbourne Borough Council without support from East Sussex County Council, who've also helped with loans and grants to get things moving and to enable us to go through the lengthy process of basically applying for, for money through 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 the sellout, for example, which is obviously complicated and way outside of the skill set of, of small scale fishermen. So they rely on other organizations or, or consultants to help them with that. But we've also had help from seafarers, for example, and then also just the local residents in Eastbourne who've sort of stood up for the fishermen. They've come to events that we've run. We know that there's a strong local demand and we know that when the quay actually opens with its public facing side in March or April next year, that there is that sort of groundswell of support there um, and and a huge amount of demand for for that buy local you know support your local producers um kind of ethos so it's um it's 10 45 now we've overrun slightly so while we could easily continue for another sort of hour i think um in the interest of being fair to our other part of the panel i'd just like to say thanks so much caroline i know it's been a, a tricky time moving between london and plymouth for you so i really appreciate you taking the time for this adam i'm sure you've got a whole day's worth of meetings so again thanks ever so much for that eloquent summary uh and filling in the gaps of graham and graham if you can hear this I hope you have a good day's fishing. And if you can't hear it, I'll speak to you later on. So thanks all very much for your time. Really appreciate it. And if you've got any questions, uh, you can go on the NEF website. You could type in Graham's story NEF and you can see the video, which is what he was uh, attempting to talk through, but, but reception, phone reception got in the way. So thank you all very much for your time. Thanks thank for you, getting us together, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Fernanda. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Um, and it was great to have um, Graham's video just showing him at work there. And you <laughs> just that was a, a little treat. Um, but thank you so much. That was great. Um, I will um, move on to this session too. Um, so I'm just going to um, say proper goodbye to Caroline, Adam, Chris, and Graham. Um, just give me one second. Bear with me. And just to say that um, at the last minute, <laughs> just as Chris was wrapping up, we got a couple more questions. Um, so Chris was able to answer one of the questions in our Q&A. Um, and just to say to Peter and Martha, um, with your questions, I will keep all the questions and, um, um, and I'll share with, the, um, with our speakers as well. But I really apologize that we weren't able to to cover them. 
Um, but I think other people can see that as well, that, uh, the Q&A um, box as well. So please feel free to um, maybe interact um, in the chat um, between um, other members of the audience. Um, so what, I, what I'll do now is I'll just bring in our next panel. So again, just give me one second and I'll just bring everyone in. All right, just waiting for Hillary. Okay, so this is our second panel. Um, so just to introduce, um, you know, Chris was um, talking about the project in Eastbourne, um, Graham's pro project in Eastbourne, um, and Caroline in Plymouth, um, and Adam, obviously, um, from the Cell App um, in regards to the support for the Eastbourne project. Those are projects that we MEF um, has been directly involved um, in supporting um, over the past five years. Um, the projects that we will talk about now um, are varied. I mean, NAF, um, you know, through this project and for our Coastal Economies program, we've been engaged with a number of people around the country. By all means, um, you know, we're not claiming any um, 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 ownership of, of, of any of these projects. Um, some of them is really about like staying in touch and promoting the work that other people are doing. Um, and this is the case here. Um, we'll have Alice and Hillary talking about um, the Agents of Change project. Um, and in England, we'll have Annabelle talking about um, her project up in West Scotland um, and the Coastal Community Network in Scotland, um, which she's a part of. And Ashlyn Lennon is from the Marine Management Organization. Um, and she'll be talking about um, the government's um, a marine pioneer um, program um, and some of the lessons from 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 there. But I'll let the speakers <laughs> introduce themselves and talk about that work. Um, we're going to start with Hillary, um, and Hillary is um, uh, the Norfolk um, Project um, uh, Coordinator for Agents of Change. So, Hillary, please. I'm just unmuting you. Okay. There you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Yes, my name is Hilary Cox, and thank you for the introduction, Fernanda. Um, my name is Hilary Cox, and I live in Cromer in Norfolk. My um, role is as part of a, um, a project enabler for the Agents of Change, which was set up a couple of years ago when there were three sites that were designated or were proposed to be um, marine conservation areas marine conservation zones and when it was muted in the local area that this was going to happen it created a huge knee-jerk reaction because it's exactly the same site where the local fishermen um, and the industry uh, is for crabs and lobsters so that was a bit of a shock and a bit of a surprise and it was thought that there would be a no fishing zone um, and I'm going to give you a bit of history, a bit of background um, about the, the local fishing crab and industry. I actually grew up in Munsley, which is eight miles down the road. Um, and my mum and dad had a hotel. Um, we lived next door to a fishing family. And so 60, 65 years ago, crab sandwiches and crab salads were popular. People would come from all over the place um, on, on holidays in those days, just locally. Um, from, from, from Leicester and Cambridge and places like that and crabs were a highlight they were a delicacy they were something special they still are today but I'll move on to that in a moment so 60 years 65 years ago I was aware of at least two um, manned fishing boats crab fishing boats which then took out three or four people to go fishing the boats weren't just catching crabs and lobsters they were a tourist attraction in their own rights um, the, the people who came to visit, the children would go down, they would watch the crab, the, the crab boats come ashore, 
they would you know sort of scramble in the boats they weren't health and safety rules and regulations and all that kind of thing in those days they would help use the um use the rollers to, to bring them up they weren't haulers and that kind of thing um and they would they would um help perhaps deliver some of the some of some of the catch my husband he wasn't my husband then obviously um but he was his family were a fishing family um, his father went to sea, his father went to see his two older brothers all went to sea, um, but Willie now fishes or did fish at Cromer. Um, they always knew that the fishing was, was special, that the, the, the crabs were, were good, um, and uh, it's continued obviously the same way over the years. When they weren't fishing for crabs and lobsters, because in those days there was more of a, a season, purely because they would then in the winter time drift for herring, um, they would catch whelks and they would line for cod. But of course, all those, all those outlets are now gone. That's gone and the, um, the fish has gone. So they can't, they, they, they catch whelks, whelks still. Um, they fished at Munsey, it was, it was, they were always known to be special. And even then the, the, the fishing along the area that's been, was designated as a marine conservation zone um was from Weybourne to to Haysborough um oh, has always been fish and has always been very very good but the you won't find and there's lots of crabs caught around um the English and Scottish waters but there's no meat as sweet as a meat from a chroma crab which makes it very very special so modern technology has revealed probably why partly clarified this because it's classed as a breeding ground um, for the for the fish and chroma crabs are allowed to be caught or crabs off this particular area allowed to be caught slightly smaller than anywhere else in the country. The fishermen also realised that how special it was without the technology of understanding why. And back in the 70s, the fishermen requested that a bylaw be implemented so that there was no trawling in the area. The reason the area now is designated as a Marine conservation zone is we have this unique, wonderful chalk bed that lies exactly the same from Weybourne to sea to, to Haysborough. Um, and there's hundreds of different species on it. There was a new species found in 2014 of a purple sponge. It is unique. It's the biggest feature chalk bed in European waters, and it's 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 the best one. But of course, the um, technology in those days wasn't around for them to understand. There were surveys done by divers um, going back 50, 60 years, um, but it didn't, wasn't a very happy relationship because um, it what had been known that divers would take the, the lobsters and crabs out of the out of the fishermen's pot. So there's a history of animosity between conservation, if you like, and fishing. Um, and part of my role being local up here was to balance the, the animosity between fishermen and conservation because they really were like hitting brick walls um, together and just not, not working together. We need to work together to um, aid the, the fishing industry. We need to work together to conserve this, this, this magical, unique area that we have. Of course, over the years, technology has also improved and the fishermen don't have to haul the pots by hand anymore. Um, they, they have um, haul, hauling mechanisms um, and the pots that they actually use aren't made of hazel sticks and wood anymore. Um, and they are larger pots now. But is that the, is that the best thing? Has, has, has that changed for the better? Because at least they were, they were using natural um, elements to build their pots with. Now they're, they're metal and they're sadly coated with plastic, which creates its own problem. Um, and so have things changed for the better? In the 80s to 90s, there were probably 58 boats fishing um, from, from Weybourne to Haysborough. There's currently around 35. What does the future hold? 15, maybe 10? Um, one of the issues is that when my husband fished, his elder brothers fished, fished they went to sea with their father and they were taught how to fish. Um, and it was a natural progression there is only one fishing family from Cromer now whose son goes to sea or, or daughter, which they wouldn't, they weren't allowed to go to sea years ago because it wasn't lucky, very unlucky for a woman to be on the beach. Um, but um, 
that, that, that natural progression isn't there. So I'm going to talk about apprenticeships in a moment. Um, Hillary, but, yeah. Hilary, sorry to interrupt you. Um, just to make sure that um, uh, we leave enough time for the other yep. speakers. Right, okay. Um, just asking you to, <laughs> sorry. So well, there, well, there is, I believe there is a future for fishing um, and um, conservation in the area. I'm so excited ab about um, about what they've done in, 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 in other areas. Caroline Bennett, that's Soul of Discretion, and um, Adam Bryant, the local LEP. I believe there is a role, there is a greater role for... Um, councils to play in that I, I believe that that community thing that they're going to do with the LEP is absolutely brilliant there needs to be somewhere for lost and damaged pots which they say are damaging the chalk bed um, should be brought home able to brought home and put somewhere um, I believe that they, we should have an apprenticeship because um, the older fishermen are interested they've done their bit but there are younger fishermen who would really like to go into sea but how do you know that you want to go to sea if your father doesn't have a boat or go to sea himself there needs to be more input um, to, to teach people and what they're doing with the LEP there to train them and to show them how it's done is ex excellent. Um, we need that employment. Norfolk doesn't have any greater employment um, than the fishing industry and tourism connected. We need to have the fishing industry to continue. And we also need to continue to the fishing because it maintains the quality of the catch. So, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of things to be said um, about it. The other thing is that we perhaps should think about um, to protect the the chalk the chalk bed and to conserve the fishing um, is to prevent outsider boats coming in. Uh, the local boats only go off a few miles, but there are bigger boats that now can come further in, which isn't perhaps a good thing. And um, it was a good point made by Chris about the governed by nature. They couldn't perhaps have. Um, set times for fishing because they can only go to sea when it's good and natural um, and, and nature will lead always on that. Um, I'll Thank perhaps finish there then because I, <laughs> yeah, I could go on but yeah that's. <laughs> I know and, and we'll have a little bit of time for discussion in the end um, yeah. hopefully so I, I'll just move us on to um, Alice who works with Hillary <coughs> um, but she's the project coordinator for Agents of Change. Um, so Alice please. Sure. Thank you, Fernanda and Hilary. Um, so, yeah, so I um, coordinate the Agents of Change project, which is a um, partnership project led by Marine Conservation Society, but also uh, with NEF and um, Fauna and Flora International and the Thames Estuary Partnership, that kind of part of a wider um, partnership project called the Marine Collaboration. And um, so what our project is about is really kind of trying new ways to kind of increase um, community kind of stewardship and ownership over their local marine protected area, um, you know, and, and really kind of creating an asset, but doing it in ways that are really led by local community values and um, celebrating them as well uh, with the hope that we would be able to kind of um, I guess help reduce conflict in um, areas such as um, as Hilary has said um, historically in for example the Norfolk area there has been um, conflict over the years between conservation and fishing and, and yet ultimately everybody wants the healthy ocean just maybe four different things so how can we how can we support communication and kind of co-understanding and so that um we can have a better outcome for all so um similar to the blue new deal in those respects so we um currently are working in three locations as hillary said around the chromer shoal chalk beds marine conservation zone in norfolk around Beachy Head East in East Sussex and um, King May Marine Conservation Zone off West Sussex. Um, all three sites chosen because they were at different stages of the Marine Conservation Zone designation process. Um, King May was designated and already had fisheries management, a tranche one site. Proma was designated when the project started but had no fisheries management, a tranche two site. And Beachy Head East, um was not designated at all when the project started um 
and so yes so our aims were to kind of bring people together so um and what we've learned from what we've done in norfolk really is to um because i guess that's the site i'll be well, we're focusing on today is um just about how important um community voice and vision is um we we when we started the project we we want we wanted to get to know local community kind of values and vision better and you know hillary was absolutely fantastic at connecting us with people um key people who we we wanted to talk to um but we also wanted to meet you know new people and hear from them in 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 different ways and so we actually um set up some community workshops to kind of discuss with them their hopes for local society and sea and uh you know what we um found from these workshops is that people really did care about having a, a thriving and improved marine environment and also a supported fishing economy but people also wanted to be informed they wanted to know about what was under their sea they wanted locals and children and visitors to know and care as well and for the information to be really wide within the community and to have this ownership and so um we asked people okay so you want these things how do we deliver them how do we bring them about what actions do you want to happen um and one of the main things to come out was um uh having a kind of education program so um connecting fishermen with a kind of local education coordinator to tell people about fishing and also to tell people about the local marine environment and so Hillary has been absolutely fantastic at leading that work connecting local schools with their local sea as in in its entirety really in all of its kind of uses with a view to supporting the future of fishing in the area but also for these potential future young fishermen to have an awareness of their local marine environment now that we have the technology they can see it and learn about it much more than perhaps you know previous fishermen could um and so you know we we're, we're starting young um we're working mostly with kind of key stage 2 um with a hope that you know even if the children we talk to don't become fishermen that they will feel really proud of their local sea and really excited by it and we already know that you know the messaging that we're kind of sending out through the um school work is is going back into homes into the wider community and so we're really pleased about that um another aspect that's been really interesting in kind of informing local people and and supporting healthy sea has been working with local tourism operators um, and actually if it hadn't been for covid hillary would have been in berlin in march talking at a big international tourism kind of conference you know celebrating the local marine conservation zone as a reason to visit norfolk and so you know there are um real opportunities for kind of i guess supporting economy um in you know sustainable ways we hope and you know i've definitely taken learning from norfolk and placed it in my project learning in sussex as well whether it's um you know through the signage that hillary was able to support us with through a kind of wider project called the deep history coast that has definitely inspired my work in sussex just to kind of help community awareness at a very kind of um light touch level just to say you know this is what's happening under your sea um and these are the people that engage with it it's um it's just a really nice um thing to do and it's actually surprising how little information when you go around the coast how little information there is about what's under the local sea for example when you visit beaches and things often a lot of safety information and not much else um the um i guess i just wanted to um finish or on two things really um the first was about kind of sharing learning between locations and i think that that is like so important so i really value you know net support with our project and also um you know the kind of 
coastal partnerships networks and all these ways that people are really trying to share learning now recognizing all these little things that are going on around the coastline um, and I guess I know it sounds uh, a little basic but one of the things that I feel is sometimes missed in communications is actually when talking about your learning also communicating the, the even just the size of the population that you're working in um, because you know, if you're the Thames Estuary Partnership working in London, your 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 community is nine million people, and in Norfolk, you know, our, our coastal community along the Cromishaw Chalk Bays is a hundred thousand, just over. And you know, when talking with Kerry Whiteside and the kind of coastal communities partnerships in Scotland, some of her islands are four hundred people, and so you know, I guess just I don't know, it's just um, learning, I guess. It seems so simple, so I hope that that isn't too kind of light for everybody, but it just seems like kind of when sharing learning, it's good to just infer about how long things take between kind of when looking at different kind of types of communities. Um, and yeah. so, okay, so I'll finish up. Sorry, Fernanda, final, okay. final thing is um, I'd say I think our main impact has been around improving communication between Kind of local policy makers and local people um i think that that co-understanding of like creating management that local people um see and understand is like a really has been a really exciting thing for us and you know we we have found for example in norfolk our kind of engagement with um the eastern ifca the local fisheries managers there has been a really interesting journey and so much so that you know, I mean, I'm not saying this is absolutely 100% us, but, you know, last year they 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 hired an, an anthropologist to support their team. And that's, you know, quite a big thing in, in, in kind of, I guess, fisheries management, you know, at a local level to actually want to understand your local communities more, I think is a really exciting thing. So, yeah, it's, the journey is still happening, but we're, yeah, enjoying it. So sorry for ever running. Thank you so much, Alice. I just want to make sure that obviously we give enough time yeah. for the speakers and for us to have a little Q and A. Um, I'm going to move on to Ashley. There, there are some questions for further information on um, agents of change. So I'll share some links. Um, I want to welcome Ashley Blenning from um, the Marine Management Organization. She's head of evidence and Marine Pioneer Program lead. Ashley, please. Thank you, Fernanda, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about the Marine Pioneer. The Pioneer was set up by DEFRA in 2017, and the aim of it is to figure out with a whole range of different kinds of people how to practically deliver the vision of the 25-year environment plan, which is to have the environment in a better state for the next generation. And we, um, we, we took this, this task on with relish and um, though we were a little daunted because it is really big. We started out um, with a, a, a group of people in North Devon and a group of people in Suffolk who were trying to figure out what to do and how to do it and how to achieve this big vision. And I think in the beginning, we thought very much about the scientific aspects of it, the data, the information, processes, um, the legislation, the regulation. But actually, as time went on, what came out of it was that um, the key to improving nature is people. And that... Um, that's a fundamental which isn't new and is probably understood by all of you. But for those of us who are involved with gathering evidence, which can sometimes be a kind of a, a removed experience from people, it really struck home that it's not that we want to recommend that we collect more data, or at least not that that's the basis of how to achieve this vision, but that the key to it really is people. And so the recommendations that are coming out of the Pioneer, and those will be publicly available before Christmas in an interactive PDF, and will cover topics like fisheries, like marine protected areas, 
community resilience, and it will talk a bit about net gain, uh, natural capital, and practically, and what's good and what's challenging about it. Um, despite the fact that those were all the things that we focused on from the beginning, the real and true lessons that have come out of the pioneer are really about governance and how important that is. And it didn't just come out of the marine pioneer, it came out of all the, all the DEFRA pioneers. There were three other ones which were to look at urban settings, um, rural landscape settings and um, water catchments. And all, all of the pioneer projects have identified that governance is a key thing to achieving our ambitions for nature. And when I say governance, what I mean is that that ability to transparently see how decisions are made, to understand why things are being done the way they are being done, and to contribute to that as a uh, um, as a citizen, as a manager, as a conservationist, where whatever perspective you have that, um, and those of us who have multiple perspectives, because that's quite important, that you are able to understand and contribute to that decision making. We also found that there is a great uh, capability in human beings to focus on separated parts of a system and to get really focused in on particular parts when actually if we really the, the the scale of the requirement we have to look after nature and to really fix things that are going wrong requires us to think about the whole system not just the ecosystem but the social and the economic systems as well and we cannot afford to just focus on separate parts because ultimately that will cause us problems and we'll will mean that we fail. So we found governance uh, important. We found focusing on the system is important. We understand implicitly that collaboration and partnership is the way to go. One of the, the great aspects of this Marine Pioneer project has been that it has been non-government and government um, people coming together in a, in a creative and open space where we could be honest with each other and talk to each other about barriers and challenges and then try and overcome those practically. And it just, after experiencing that through the pioneer, I feel like there is no other way that we can do the things that we need to do, but, but in a more collaborative and, and partnership-based way. And that's a crucial recommendation that we'll be giving back to DEFRA and sharing with everybody. And then, and then ultimately, if, if we have this shared goal, which, which we should have, uh, I, I would hope that we can all share this goal of improving the environment. Um, and although the 25 year environment plan is about the next generation, I'm quite fond of this generation. <laughs> I would quite like this to be for all of us for now, for as soon as we can do it together. And, and, and it's gonna require a lot of cooperation and, and not just co-management, which is a, a thing that the government is talking about a lot, and government agencies, but actually co-design, co-develop, co-production, co-delivery. Essentially, everything needs to be cooperative in, in, in as broad a sense as we can make it. And these are the recommendations that we will make um, from the pioneer and the lessons that we are learning. And just as a last point, if I may, um, focusing in on the marine management organization where I work, we are 10 years old this year, and we have launched what we call the MMO story, which is in some ways a precursor to a new strategy, but in, 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 in more important ways is about saying, this is who we are and this is what we would like to do. This is how we're going to spend the next year thinking about the next 10 years and how we will focus on people and nature to try and deliver something that's good for all of us. And that we will do that by collaborating, by using all the ranges of evidence and information and learning that we can, and how we will try and iterate uh, in partnership with lots of people. And that's it for me. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Fernanda, to, to talk um, about the pioneer and to be in the company of such great people that we've heard today. Thank you so much, Ashley, that was great. Um, I'm going to move quickly to Annabelle, just make sure that we've got enough time to hear from everyone, and hopefully we'll have enough time for a couple of questions. So Annabelle, please, um, can you tell us your story? 
Ah, uh, yes. And um, the the images, will you be able to put those on screen? Yes. Just give me one second. Hi there. So while the um, images um, are loaded, I'll just tell you a bit about myself. So I'm, um, my name's Annabelle Lawrence, and I live on the west coast of Scotland, which some of you may be familiar with, on mainland. And I look across to the Isle of Mull. And um, I um, started my career as an underwater archaeologist, diving on uh, historic shipwrecks. And many of those shipwrecks, uh, there's quite a few examples around the west coast of Scotland, one being at Jewett Point on the Sand of Mull. And um, I'm here today to tell you a bit about my role in our local um, uh, coastal community group, uh, which came about as um, in response to the Scottish government um, introducing a series, a network of marine protected areas around Scotland. And one of the um, MPAs is Sunart, Loch Sunart to the Sound of Jura. And another one is Loch Sunart and the purpose of those um, marine protected areas was to um, protect um, certain priority marine features that have been identified by Scottish Natural Heritage which is now called Nature Scotland and our priority marine features in our area were um, the flapper skate um, and flame shell mussels, uh, northern feather stars and circulid worms of which we've got fantastic examples here on the west coast of Scotland. So this community group, Coolus, um, which is the Community Association of Locks and Sounds, which is um, uh, in Gaelic, means narrows, was set up with the main purpose of, um, can we go back to the first slide, sorry? Yeah, the main purpose of outreach with our local community to tell them about the MPA and to get them excited and involved in the fact we have an MPA, which is fantastic because we understood that, um, you know, uh, protection, would allow recovery and that would then have benefits, you know, economic and social um, to our local area. Um, but of course, the outreach um, has led to awareness. And um, next slide. Um, we also became interested in monitoring the activity in our MPA. Now, when the MPA was um, instigated in uh, 2014, uh, management measures for controlling fishing activity specifically the more damaging mobile fishing activity, as in scallop dredging and trawling, those management measures weren't introduced for a while. But when they were introduced, um, we thought, great, you know, we can, we can really see the benefits of the marine protected area. Um, but unfortunately, our area has been subject to a lot of um, continued um, illegal fishing activity within the MPA. So our role changed from outreach to kind of monitoring. And next slide and uh, reporting all these incidences. So the first, the previous slide showed you um, a seabed that had been recently dredged in the MPA with broken shells. And this one here is um, a, uh, a legal creel incident on it within the MPA, but also um, on a historic marine protected area as well. So it's, it's like a double, a double whammy. So there's a 366 year old wreck on the seabed here. Um, with, a, with a visitor trail all going around it for visitor divers to come and you know, explore the site. And um, a krill boat placed a load of krills on the site. And we were able to report it um, to the marine compliance part of Marine Scotland. If you go to the next slide. Um, just to give you an idea of the kind of um, material that's present on the seabed at this historic marine protected area. So we've got really good organic material that's been preserved. Um, we have a site plan there on the top left, which shows you part of the ship and the ballast mounds and the cannons. And it's also protected, used to be protected under the Protection and Recs Act, but now it's under the Historic Marine Protected Area Act, which is access, but no impact. So of course, having fishing activity in this area is, is very sensitive and we felt needed to be dealt with and was, was reported. So our role's sort of changing a bit now. So we've got, we've done the outreach, we've got the awareness, but we're also becoming like the police force, which is, uh, uh, quite a responsibility in an area that's over 741 square kilometres of west coast of Scotland. Um, so uh, we have our work cut out for us. So, uh, so engaging our community is really important because they're the eyes on that area. Um, next slide. Um, and again, um, another example here of uh, this is actually a war grave 
it's, it's a it's a crashed aircraft site and again you can see the top left there i've circled the little object on the seabed so that's that has been removed from the wing of the um it's a sponsor from the um short sunderland aircraft that's on the seabed there and it's been you can see the dredge marks that have gone over the gone over the site and picked up part part of the wing and taken it away and obviously you can see here fishing nets and things so we have a real conflict between the cultural heritage and fishing activity which in most cases um is uh should be should be managed better but there's, there's a lack of compliance and enforcement in our in our mpa but leading on to um uh next slide um what this what this then means so we, we've got the mpa and we, we kind of thought this argument between fishing and you know our our resource um is one we're probably having trouble having it's, it's quite it's quite a difficult debate to have basically so um another another way that we thought about um, raising awareness and getting people engaged in a positive way was to celebrate and have more sort of wider recognition of the amazing biodiversity that we had here in the um, MPA. And so with that in mind, we took the existing MPA, which you can see on the on the left hand map there, which is Loch Sunart, and then all the way down Sand of Mull, um, up halfway up Loch Linney and Fort Williams at top, and then down into the Sand of Jura. And we, um, four community groups um, within the Coastal Community Network, um, decided to nominate this area for a Mission Blue Hope spot to recognise the biodiversity and to celebrate it. And we feel that giving a positive message about, you know, why it's good, you know, how it benefits local communities and also almost create like a, not really a brand, but something that people is a bit more tangible about marine protected areas. It's not just about fishing and conservation objectives and fishing management. It's also about the fact you've got some amazing resource and perhaps it could attract more um, economic activity and social benefits to, to the area. Going to the next slide. Um, and this has um, sort of coincided with, um, in Scotland, Visit Scotland's um, theme year was the year of coastal waters. And there's been an awful lot of research done building up to this year, which was obviously COVID year, so it's been postponed, about what the marine tourism looks like on the west coast where we've got most of the marine protected areas the economic value of um, the marine sector in scotland and which parts are actually delivering the 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 gross um, value added and also the development of more sustainable um, blue um, tourism activities that actually support local economies local lo local businesses and the and the environment so when we looked into this um, this idea of adding value um, through tourism um, and we had the creation of the giant strides which is the latest marine tourism strategy we've had the research behind it where we, we know where all our marine and coastal tourism businesses are in relation to the marine protected areas and we also know that a lot of them want to develop better and more resilient and sustainable business models going forward probably for the domestic market as we've already mentioned earlier and we've also got the marine economic statistics which show that um, the marine tourism sector is worth about 550 million um, per year to the Scottish marine economy. And um, compare that to, uh, and it employs maybe 20, 20 odd thousand people. Um, but uh, compare that to fishing where it's a much, much lower uh, gross value added and less people involved. But in terms of which one impacts the most on the environment, we need to look at the cost of that as well. And we have this, uh, in the Scottish government, they want to make um, tourism and particularly marine tourism a career of choice. And we look at the um, the salaries associated with you know tourism industry, and they're not very well paid. You know, we want to attract we want to attract you know um, you know people to this to the sector that have got a real vision for how to manage sustainably the natural capital, so that everybody can benefit from it. Um, so we're at quite a we're at quite a um, interesting point in Scotland because people are starting to value the marine environment for much more than just fishing, and we have marine protected areas which tend to focus on um, management measures for fishing. Um, when whereas we could be thinking about them as more like destinations for other types of activity. And I love the link between the soul of discretion, how they link you know the fishing to the local market, um, and then the, there's there's really good tra traceability. So in Scotland, you know, 
in the West Coast, most of our scallops go obviously to the, to the continent and we import most of the white fish that we eat for our fish and chips. So we need to have that discussion about, you know, uh, what, you know, who are, we, who are we trying to support and how do we build resilience back into our local communities? And talking on scale, um, the community I live in is 300 and, 320 people live where I live and Coolis, which is part of the Coast Community Network, um, represents an area called Arden Merck and, and Morven, and that's maybe 2,000 people. But the benefit of being connected with the Coastal Community Network, which has now got over, I think it's over 18 different community groups across Scotland, a lot on the West Coast, is that we feel um, we are connecting um, and building um, not only knowledge, because we share an awful lot of knowledge between ourselves, but we're actually, we're actually um, great, yeah, having a voice and um, we're getting to speak to government ministers about policy. And um, we feel that um, the community voice has been really well harnessed within this network. And that's probably been the, the best thing really, because if you're working on a very local scale, you can make small, small changes, but if you want to, if you want, if you want to plan, you know, for a much more resilient future, you need, you need a lot more voices in the room. And I think that's what the Coastal Community Network has given us. Thank you so much, Annabelle. Um, I'm really glad we got to hear from everyone. We don't have a lot of time left um, for questions, but just to say that um, one of the questions here is um, regarding what kind of barriers the communities face in getting involved with stewardship of their local areas. How can this be overcome? Um, there was also a question um, for, um, for Hillary um, on what have you found are the most effective ways to overcome local knee-jerk opposition to MCZs. Um, so I'll just give, you know, um, a few seconds, please, um, for any react. I, I just wanted to read the questions, but um, and feel free to, to, to answer them. But just a quick um, few um, uh, seconds of like a final statement from everyone, if that's okay, on reflections and everything that has been said. And it's, it's optional if you want to say something. Nanda, I'll say something. I think the most important thing for me is, is recognizing the difference in approach in terms of, certainly from a government point of view, in terms of thinking about nature and the environment the focus really has shifted toward people and not on nature itself. Nature itself will recover and flourish yeah. and very well if we are not um, causing it problems. And I think that this turn toward focusing on how we as people can live in harmony and, um, and support ourselves in a sustainable way within nature is, 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 has been a really nice thing to come out of listening to what people are talking about today. Yeah. It feels positive and hopeful in a time when things aren't all together hopeful for everyone. And if I may add to that, Fernanda, I agree with Ashling entirely. It, it is, it, the, the, and to answer the question, how to overcome the local knee-jerk reaction is, is communication and understanding. And I suppose I use the word education, not, um, you know, not sort of but it's 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 an understanding of so people can live together can work together can get on together within a community rather than keeping in separate little boxes and and, and not sharing information not sharing knowledge not sharing um you know the, the the area that you've got because people lots of people use the sea lots of people want to be on the beach but we need to understand what you know what what it is and 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 and, and do it together and I think for, for me communication this I, I mean so, so excited about what I've heard this morning about all oh, what's going on everywhere else you tend to because I live in such a, um, a limited kind of um, environment for myself you know you tend to forget that all these problems are happening in various ways all around um, our island and and in other parts of the world and, and it gives you a, a far better view when you're here what's happening in other places and um, a better understanding. And I think communication is the way forward. And for local knee jerk reaction is just getting within the community and getting them involved with what you're doing, which is exactly what I've heard other people doing today. So it's a really, really good job. And yeah, 
well done. I think um, both of you have summarized all my thoughts as well, um, Ashley and Hillary. Um, I'm sorry we don't have more time um, because I knew it was going to be a great discussion, but I think just being able to feature all of your voices, all of your stories, all the learnings um, from different projects from around the coast, I think that's the powerful thing. We've shared loads of links. Please do um, please do get in touch if you if you want any more links or any more <laughs> directions. I'm happy to direct people um, to all of these wonderful projects. Um, and I'll be putting them up on the NEF website as well. Um, we'll be sharing the webinar recording um, you know, very soon. So thank you so much to everyone. Thank you for everyone that joined um, and participated. Um, and yeah, please, please check out <laughs> all these projects more and, and, and engage. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.